So it is my pleasure to introduce as our third speaker, Carlos Martinez del Rio, who is professor of zoology and physiology at the University of Wyoming and the director of the UW Biodiversity Institute. Carlos got his bachelor's of science from the Universidad Nacional Autónoma de Mexico and his PhD from the University of Florida. He has taught at Princeton, the University of Arizona, now UW, as well as higher institutes in Mexico, Chile, and Colombia. Carlos is a biologist who studies ecology from multiple perspectives. The strange creatures he studies with scientific rigor and human affection include hummingbirds, bats, mistletoe, and moths. He looks at the creaturely world in relationship to eating habits, especially, and thinks about how eating habits affect biology. Carlos's work has been recognized and supported by grants from the National Science Foundation and National Geographic. He has published voluminously, placing his research in scholarly venues including the Journal of Experimental Biology, Ecology, Physiological Zoology, Comparative Biology, Biochemistry and Physiology, Trends in Ecology and Evolution, the North American Journal of Fisheries Management, the Journal of Aviation Biology. And I cite those titles just to give you a sense of Carlos's remarkable range. His, the wide scope of his interest is apparent in his title today, Biodiversity Inside and Out, a look at life's richness from Wyoming's perspective. Please welcome Carlos Martinez del Rio. Uh, hello. Uh, well, can you hear me? Uh, is this working okay? Uh, thank you very, very much uh, for being here. And uh, I really would like to thank Sheridan College. I would like to thank Marsha especially because she, she took the chance of inviting a scientist into this collection of people in the humanities. So the title of my talk, and I hope you can see that, is Biodiversity Inside and Out, a look at life's richness from Wyoming's perspective. And I will adopt, I, I feel very much a Wyomingite. Uh, uh, when uh, um, Peter mentioned that uh, I, I had been at the University of Arizona, I'm the only faculty I know that I was headhunted by the University of Arizona and I couldn't stand it. I had to come back to Wyoming. I love this. I love this place. I really, really like this place. Um, so I'll tell you right away what I'm going to tell you. Let's, let's start by telling you what I'm going to tell you. Uh, I'll describe what biodiversity is. And I will tell you that biodiversity is, is all around you, now, now here. There are more species here now than in the tropical rainforest. I hope you realize that. Uh, it's in the most unexpected places, and it is enormously useful. Um, and then I'll tell you why Wyoming's biodiversity is special. And I will look, you know, lose some of my thunder by telling you it's not because Wyoming is specially diverse. It is not because we have a, an enormously large number of species. But it is because we have complete sets of species and large landscapes that are relatively untouched. So there are other names for biodiversity. If you are uh, religious, uh, you'd call it the life component of creation. You can call it life's variety, the diversity of life. If you're an economist like class, you might call it biological capital. <laughs> and uh, I thought that was going to be the first one, so my preparation was about breakfast. Now, it should have been about lunch. So I will start my talk uh, by talking about the granola recipe that we use at home. Um, so Martha and I prepare this granola recipe. And we add strawberries, blueberries for antioxidants and milk and yogurt. Can you tell me how many species are there? Does anybody have any idea of how many species might be in this pretty simple uh, granola recipe? Well, I'll, I'll spare you the counting. Um, <laughs> there are at least 14 species there. So I hope you realize this. Every time you eat a bowl of good granola, uh, you're eating 14 species. So what is biodiversity? Uh, biodiversity has all species and their breeds. Uh, you don't have only one um, variety of wheat or oats, you have a bunch of them. Uh, the genes in those organisms. And the genes determine not only that you have different species, but also that um, you have different breeds. The breeds have different genetic constituencies. And I think it is very important for someone like me that studies ecological processes to recognize that biodiversity, in addition, includes the ecolo ecological connections among organisms. And let's talk about the milk and yogurt component of the, of the breakfast thing. And here was one of my uh, clicker questions. How many breeds of cattle? I, this is in part a cattle town. Um, how many breeds of cattle do you think there are in the world? It's just a simple question. So here you would be rapidly clicking. It's really cool to use clickers because you tell your students, okay, talk with each other. And when you ask them that, they always get it 
right. If you don't, and I've done statistics on, on this, they don't, so there's collaboration in learning. So, well, the answer is, um, dang, the answer is 800. There are 800 species of breeds. Most of them are dairy cattle. Of course, there's no such thing as dairy cattle, right? We use them for, for, for meat as well. And uh, so there's a really large number of um, breeds um, of cattle. So let's talk about cattle and the ecological interactions in which they participate. You might think that they, you know, cattle are really boring, right? They eat grass, and the, the cow eats the grass, and then we eat either the milk, or we drink the milk, or we eat the, the beef. So it seems like the simplest possible ecological interaction and the most boring one. Well, this becomes really complicated when you look things from the inside. Suppose that you take the cow and you look at the stomach of the cow, and you look at how many microbial, quote unquote, species are there. And we can do that now with molecular techniques. There are 760 species of bacteria in the rumen of a cow. And only six are really abundant, but there are a bunch of others there. So whenever you see this very simple uh, food web, what you really have is grass, which is really indigestible. Uh, just try to eat a little bit of cellulose and you'll see how uh, indigestible it is. And then you have this incredible ecosystem of bacteria that transform this indigestible stuff into digestible material that the cow can assimilate, which then we can ingest. Um, so even the simplest food web ends up being a very complicated one. So the, to summarize, the cow stomach has a really complex microbial ecosystem that allows the cow to use, I mean, you can feed a cow basically on um, urea and, and newspaper. And they would, well, you, you have to add minerals and so on. But this ecosystem allows it to do those, that thing. And, and I think that one of the things that we don't recognize is that microbes rule. The world is ruled by microbes. Much as we would love to talk about birds, or uh, I love birds, uh, bats and so on. But these are the things that really rule the world. So let me tell you a couple of interesting factoids about microbes. But first, I would like to give you a lesson. The first lesson is that we all depend on very diverse and very complex microbial food webs. If you care about fertility in the soil, if you care about clean water, if you care about all those things, you have to think about microbes. And we just learned how to study them over the last 10 years. Um, so let me give you a, uh, I would like to give you a few cool observations. One, this one uh, is from about oh, three or four years ago. And it's, I think, it's an astounding observation. The human microbiome, the collection of my, all microbes in your body, contains 100 trillion cells. I'm sorry, this is a bit dark, because this is a suitably creepy image uh, <laughs> for, for, for Carolyn's stuff. Your bodies only have 10 trillion cells. What that means is that for each one of your own cells, there are 10 bacterial cells in your body. Suppose that you were to magnify all the microbes in your face. Uh, this is what you would see. Uh, you would see a tropical rainforest with different habitats, right? Each one of your orifices, uh, and let's do the politically correct ones like the mouth and the nostrils and the ears <laughs> and so on and so forth, would have all these, all these microbes in them. And they're doing all these things that we, for a long, long time, um, didn't know. We didn't even know they were there. I have a friend that uh, studies the geography of keyboards. It may sound really bizarre, right? Uh, so what he does is he, he goes with a swab and measures what microbes are found. And there are different communities in each one of your fingers. Uh, so anyway, um, so uh, and, and here I need to ask the audience a question. How many of you, I, I'm sorry, this is a very private question, which is nice um, to use uh, the clickers for, because then you're anonymous. But how many people still have an appendix? A large number, that, that is great. Um, well, it used to be that physicians used to chop your appendix at the drop of a hat. I don't know if you remember that, but they, because people thought that it was just a little, this useless piece of flesh that you could chop off. Well, it happens that it is not. And it used to be, uh, like uh, um, Carolyn reminded us, people used to have diarrhea all the time. If you read the, um, the travels of Lewis and Clark, they were in the bushes all the time, uh, <laughs> suffering from diarrhea. And that is a very dangerous thing because you lose all your microflora. 
And so what happens is that the appendix, now we have very good evidence that it's a safe house. It's a reservoir of beneficial bacteria. And this has been um, demonstrated clinically by a very interesting observation, which is that I suspect that many of you have used broad-spectrum herbicides. When you use broad-spectrum herbicides, you kill all the plants, and what happens? The field gets covered with weeds, right? Well, when you take broad-spectrum antibiotics, the, thing, the exact same thing happens with your gut, and you lose all your native flora, microflora, and then weeds invade. And one of these weeds is Clostridium difficile. Difficile means difficult in Latin, because it's very difficult to treat. Well, it happens that if you are fortunate enough to have an appendix, then you don't get close to your infections. And the reason is that the appendix contains all these beneficial bacteria that then reinvade the colon and prevent the invasion of this um, nasty uh, parasite. It's a really nasty one. Um, so I hope, and I, I'm sorry, this is maybe a bit corny, but when you think about the, the appendix, don't think about it as a, as a useless piece of flesh. Uh, think about it as a Noah's art that is there just preserving all these organisms, <laughs> just waiting for the flood to come. I'm sorry, that's a really bad joke. <laughs> but uh, so, so they can, so can reinvade. Um, so uh, I think that one of the things that I, I think a lot about it, uh, I think a lot about conservation these days. And I think you can think about the appendix as the greater Yellowstone ecosystem, you know, a place that we save with native species so that we can get them to the future. And I will talk about the, the, the appendix and the lessons a, a lot, but I think that we can find lessons in conservation within our own bodies. There's one more cool observation, which is that not only there are more bacterial cells in your body than your own cells, there are the hell of a lot more genes. The human microbiome contains over a million genes. We just learned that. So for each one of your genes, because we only have 23,000 genes, we learned this from the human genome, for each one of the genes in your body, there are about 40 bacterial ones. Um, and they do all sorts of things. I don't know how many uh, uh, geneticists I have in the audience. I'm going to give you a completely Mickey Mouse explanation of what genes are. And um, it's mostly a pretext to talk about the Bible. Um, so the genome, the collection of all your genes, is called the genome. And the genome contains chapters, and these chapters are gene networks that perform some function. They synthesize a set of proteins that end up doing some function, like uh, metabolize glucose or something of the sort, like lactose in milk, or so on and so forth. And genes are one-sentence instructions that often code for a single protein. Um, for example, in the, Bib in the Bible, you have the book of Job that tells you, but ask the animals, and they will teach you, or the birds of the air, and they will tell you, or speak to the earth, and it will teach you, or let the fish of the sea inform you. So the 11th commandment is, thou shalt study biodiversity. <laughs> and, uh, uh, so anyway, um, so we are in the age of genetics, right? And, and Watson and Crick in 1953 discovered that the material that transmits genetic information is DNA, and they, you know, they discovered how it, how it coded for proteins and so on. And um, we can use genetic information about, for a variety of things. You all know this, so I will go very briefly over this. We can use it to diagnose and screen for genetic conditions, to devise effective and safe therapies. We use it in biotechnology. Those of us that, uh, that use insulin for whatever reason, I hope you know that insulin is derived uh, from a human gene that was placed into a bacterium and then grown in batches. And that's the way we get insulin. We use it, genetics to develop agricultural products. And up to 10 years ago, we didn't know how to study microbes because 90% of the microbes in the world cannot be cultured. So we use it to study microbes. And we use it very importantly to find out the genealogical relationships among organisms. And this is some, uh, there's some of many, many applications. One of the things that I, I, I don't know if you know about this story, but this is a great one, is that we owe much of the molecular genetics to a biodiversity discovery in Wyoming. And the reason for that is that many organisms don't have a lot of DNA. And to study something, you have to have lots of copies of it. So you need to amplify it. And we, for that, we use temperature cycling and a very important enzyme, uh, a catalyzer, called TAC polymerase. Well, uh, TAC polymerase was discovered 
in the mushroom pool in Yellowstone. A very curious microbiologist started studying uh, the microbial bugs uh, living there, and the temperature is 176 degrees Fahrenheit which is the temperature of a well-done steak, which is a crime, I mean, to make a well-done steak. Uh, so I hope you realize how warm this place is. And they discover a thing called Thermos Aquaticus, from which you can extract this protein that then you can use to amplify um, DNA. I'm sorry to, to mention that this is where it was discovered. Now we know that everywhere there is a thermal pool, there's Thermos Aquaticus. It's very widely distributed, but it was discovered in Wyoming. So we have a very important role uh, we played a very important role in the development of genetics. So the second reason biodiversity is useful is that we can use enormous diversity in function. Organisms do all sorts of things. They live in all sorts of places for agricultural, industrial, biomedical, and scientific purposes. None of the applications of genetics would be possible or would be as easy as they are now if we had not discovered thermos aquaticus. If someone interested in biodiversity for its own sake had gone and studied these microbes in Yellowstone. Uh, so I told you that we can use genetic information to find out the genealogical relationships among organisms. And here I will get personal, we'll talk about uh, something that happened in my family with cattle. I come from a family that raised cattle for 250 years. And so if you look at the genealogy of the breeds of cattle, uh, you find this pattern. You find a bunch of breeds uh, that were developed in Europe, they have a common ancestor. And they share a common ancestor with those that were developed in Japan and so on and so forth. And this is tremendously useful knowledge um, to have. I, I mentioned that I grew up in a cattle ranch and I remember distinctly as a child waiting for the famous Aberdeen Angus uh, herd. And my dad had bought you know, a bunch of cows, Angus cattle. And it was a, an ameliorated disaster. And um, Angus cattle, which are the ones that you see most often in the United States, are great because they are hornless, they are pulled, they have marble meat, uh, they develop really rapidly, and they are relatively docile. However, they absolutely suck. If you live in a tropical climate that has lots of uh, parasites, we learn a lot of rocks, and I will not explain why that ba was bad, it was bad for the bulls. And, um, and so it was not a very good thing. We spent a lot of time putting them in baths to remove ticks and so on and so forth. So what, what is the possible solution? Because you want to have those characteristics. So my dad uh, moved on to Brahman. And they worked a lot better because they are heat resistant. They are resistant to arthropod pests. They, they are very, very good with ticks because they sweat. And they are resistant to internal parasites, but they develop more slowly and they are absolutely nasty. Uh, we had a bull called the little babe, El Nene, that used to hide in, in, in the oak groves. And every time you went to try to get this damn bull, someone got hurt. It was absolutely appalling. And I, I mean, it was like a joke. And they, they sent, I remember really well going on horseback into this burr oak thing. And suddenly hearing the bush moving, and I thought, oh my god, I'm going to get creamed. And it was a, it was a pack of peccary. Uh, and I was like, Phew. <laughs> that's a pretty good thing. Uh, so what we can do is breed them together. And then we end up, if, we, if you take if you take three-eighths Brahman and five-eighths Angus, you end up with Brangus, which is heat resistant. It's resistant to arthropod pests and internal parasites. It's pulled, it is docile, and it has really good uh, carcass characteristics. So I would like to just emphasize that biodiversity is not only wild biodiversity. Uh, it's also domestic, and we have to pay attention to both. Um, let me just give you one more example. Just, I was going to skip this one, but because there's a heart in it, I, and Carolyn talked about dissections, <laughs> uh, I had to mention this. Uh, uh, we received this heart when I was teaching anatomy for, for my with my students, and I was really thrilled. I, I went to the meat department and I asked him for a bunch of hearts. I'm sorry, this is the kind of things I do, Carolyn. <laughs> and you'll never talk to me again. I'm Dr. Knox or something. <laughs> anyway. And, <laughs> And so I told, the, I told the students, um, what is wrong with that heart? What is wrong with that heart? It's big. And the right side. Fantastic. Really good answer. A biologist. <laughs> in, in, most, in, in, in most mammals, um, the left side of the heart goes to the systemic circulation. And it's really big. It needs to impose a lot of pressure. And the right heart is wimpy. It's pretty small. In these animals, the right-hand side is, is hyperdeveloped, and that is because they have 
uh, pulmonary hypertension. Blood cannot be delivered to the lungs. And Angus cattle are not very good at dealing with high elevations. This is, a, a, this is part of a university's herd in Laramie, which is at 7,200 feet. You guys live in the tropics. And uh, <laughs> one of the ways we can, we can ameliorate the problem of this thing called brisket disease uh, by introgressing, by taking genes from Galloway cattle and Tarantay. Tarantay are migratory, uh, and the people move them up and down mountains, and they are very resistant to this disease. And this hasn't happened because we don't understand very well what causes this. And we know that it's very common in Angus cattle. Um, uh, but we have a problem. I told you we have 800 breeds of cattle. Uh, of this, 38% are not at risk. 35% we don't know. We lost 11%. 10 are endangered. And 6% are endangered, but we're protecting them. And as I told you from the, um, from the appendix, there are very good reasons to conserve diversity, right? In the case of domestic biodiversity, we have genetic di biodiversity for future uh, agricultural industry. We have historical and cultural value in this species, in, in, in these varieties. And um, there are climate stresses. Uh, things are getting warmer, um, whether you believe it or not. And, um, and there are emerging diseases, in, in, in especially in industrial cattle. And we can use these varieties to save the, um, the day. And then we have crossbreeding potential. In, in Peru and Ecuador, there are 4,000 varieties of potatoes. In the United States, we only use 56. We have to be much more um, cognizant of this diversity and use it. So biodiversity, and this is my third lesson of why it's useful, because we depend on domesticated biodiversity for food security. This is one of my favorite breeds of goats. I, I like goats. And um, this is churro goats developed by the Navajo in the southwest. They do very well at high elevations and cold weathers and so on and so forth. So, but I've been talking about bugs, microbes, and I've been talking about um, domesticated diversity. Let's talk about what makes us special. Let's talk about Wyoming, and let's talk about wild biodiversity. I, I hope you know this place. Um, you live there. It's a gorgeous place to live. And uh, this is the Red Desert. This is Adobe Town. And this is an agricultural landscape in Goshen County where uh, sometimes there are pheasants, more often there are not. And, um, <laughs> and this is, there are some elements of the biodiversity uh, of Wyoming. And here I apologize if you like the you know, little crawly things uh, like snails and so on. I will not talk about mushrooms and so on. I will talk about mammals and I will talk about fish uh, because they illustrate the point that I will make very, very well. Uh, but Wyoming has great diversity. So how many species of mammals do you think are around in Wyoming? And I wish I, I could have given you the clicker question because this is an interesting one. <coughs> well, there, the world has about 4,000 species and the U.S. has 420. What proportion of these 420 do you think can be found? Any guess? C. No, it's D. It's 119. Uh, so, and it, Wyoming has only 78 species of native fishes. Um, so let's compare the biodiversity of Wyoming with the biodiversity of a place of a similar or comparable area, which is Ecuador, which is only 3,000 um, square kilometers bigger. So Wyoming has about 2,500 species of plants. Ecuador has 14,000. Uh, Wyoming has 119 species of mammals. Ecuador has four times as many. Uh, Wyoming has 303 species of birds. Ecuador has 1,600. The number of species of all bird species in Wyoming is the same, roughly, as the same number of hummingbirds uh, in, in Ecuador. These are the areas of the world that illustrate for biodiversity, and areas with hot color represent areas with uh, higher diversity. And Wyoming is not even close. Uh, even in the United States, Appalachia, California, um, the coastal plain in the panhandle of Florida, those are really biodiverse places. So when you ask the question, how diverse is Wyoming? Well, the answer is not very. But don't get sad about it, because Wyoming is truly a very special place. I, I really <laughs> think it's a very special place. I mean, where else can you just drive around and see uh, bald eagles sitting in a tree? And uh, I wouldn't live anywhere else, frankly. 
Um, so let me tell you why Wyoming is special. It is very special because we can still find, and this is not very common at all, vast, relatively unfragmented landscapes. And I, th I have chosen your neighborhood to give this example. I have chosen the Powder River. And I have chosen the Powder River because people will think I'm insane. <laughs> it, it's not very attractive, right? I mean, it's like brown, salty. In the drought, it's all these pools. Um, it, it's not like um, the most, uh, the Bighorn is prettier for sure. Um, why is it special? Why is the Powder River special? It illustrates one aspect of Wyoming landscapes that I think is important. First of all, it is very long. It's 800 kilometers long. It's 500 miles or so, and it has no dams. There are damn few places in the United States. <laughs> <laughs> I'm sorry. Uh, it has all its native species still. There are uh, 32 species there because there are a bunch of introduced ones, and 25 are native. And some of these species are highly migratory. For example, you have shovel-nosed sturgeon, and you have channel catfish. Uh, a channel catfish that was uh, tagged by game and fish, just around here, uh, ended up uh, in Ohio. And my, my colleague Wayne Hubert said that the Powder River is unique because it represents the kind of biological community that Lewis and Clark saw. It's the kind that was found in the free-flowing great rivers of the plains. Um, now, it, it has another important um, feature. This is uh, a map with the densities of COVID-19 wells um, throughout the United States. The highest density is in the San Juan Basin in the border between New Mexico and Colorado. And the next, next highest density is in the Powder River. If you look at the Powder River, it is surrounded uh, by wells. See, one of these dots is uh, COVID-19. Well, and um, we need energy. However, in the process of getting energy, whenever we struck all these wells, in addition to methane, we have water coming out with high concentrations of bicarbonate. And recently, in 2012, the USGS determined in a series of uh, experimental trials that bicarbonate can be very toxic to aquatic organisms. So pollution is a threat to Wyoming's natural diversity. And I will not minimize this threat, but I don't want you uh, this is not a gloom and doom talk. I don't want you to end up with this message. What I would like you to uh, go back home is think we live in an amazing place because we can still find relatively untrammeled landscapes. Now, I'm not minimizing the threats, and I will mention a lot of them, but uh, Wyoming is a really special place, and this is one of the reasons. The second reason is that in Wyoming, and this is not something that happens uh, in, in many places in the lower 48, we can still find more or less complete assemblages of wild species. We still have all the carnivores, uh, especially now that we have black-hooded ferrets, and we have uh, all, the, all the ungulates. And these species are economically very, very important. Um, just in licenses, uh, Game and Fish gets $32 million. The people that uh, come and hunt in the state, or, or those of us that hunt in the state, spend a lot of money. And so the total amount and um, Klaas told me yesterday that you should never trust the numbers of economists. So I got, the, I got, I got these numbers from Wyoming Game and Fish <laughs> and, uh, from an economist, so I have no idea whether they are right or not. But um, the toll just for hunting is about $400,000 million. And if you include non-consumptive uses, that adds up to $2 billion. Klaas, you will have to correct me at some point and, and put error bars in this thing. But this is, this is not small change. This is a lot, a lot of money coming out directly of biodiversity. And I would like to emphasize that it comes out as a result of good stewardship. Um, so these are the dividends of conservation. In 1923, there were only 23,000 elk in the state. Um, the numbers increase until now. We have about 108,000. Well, this is 2010. We harvest now 21,000 which is about the number that we had in 1923. The number of antelope in the state ranged from 6,000 to 20,000. And um, the harvest now, we have over half a million. Actually, it, this ranges from 500 something to 650,000. And we harvest now a lot more than there used to be in the whole state, conservation pace. And um, so biodiversity is useful, one more lesson, because Wyoming receives significant income from biodiversity. We wouldn't have the tourism industry that we have if we didn't have biodiversity. So let me give you another reason why you are special. 
Um, in Wyoming, we can still find more or less complete assemblages of wild species. I already mentioned that. But they're doing what they have been doing for millennia. And let me give you just a few explanations. One that is, um, or examples, one that is very famous is the, I, I hope you know this, but Wyoming is graced by the longest migration of ungulates in the whole lower 48. And this is an example that everybody should know. Uh, there's a herd of antelope in Grand Teton National Park that moves all the way down to the Red Desert south of Pinedale every year through a very narrow migration corridor. We know from archaeological data that this has been taking place for at least 5,000 years. This was discovered by two biologists at the university, Holt Sawyer and Fred Lindsay, the wonderful people. And this has been recently propagandized by Joe Rees and Emmeline Othland that won the award of the best article in the high country news and the best environmental reporting or something of the sort. Um, this is one of the photographs that Joe took. I wish this was lighter because this is a great, great photograph of a doe crossing a river along that migration corridor. And pronghorn are not the only migratory ungulates in the state. Elk do it, and I will talk about that in just a minute. Uh, mule deer do it. And now we know a lot about it because we can put collars on these organisms. And in the case of ungulates, because they are relatively large, they are relatively innocuous, and either you let the collar drop off and then get the data, or um, the data is transmitted into a satellite and the organism is emailing you constantly where they are, <laughs> which is very convenient. <laughs> and um, so let me just describe, just to illum illuminate another thread, a study done by Hall Sawyer uh, in the southern part of the state, uh, in the foothills of the Sierra Madres. This is, a, I, I think, a very important, very, very lovely um, study. He put collars on a bunch of does. And let me show you the data. I will explain how this, this is a statistical summary of a very complex, large data set with uh, movement data recorded every hour. And this is the place where the deer spend the summer. Then they are moving through these corridors into their wintering areas. And the black, the red splotches represent stopover sites, which are of good enough, high, uh, good enough quality so that the deer spend their lots and lots of time. Um, one thing that I, I, I found very surprising is that these uh, hot sites, stopover sites, are consistent from year to year. The animals use these stopover sites from year to year. And this is the place where they spend the winter. I, I am sorry you cannot see this, but you can see these little polygons um, here. And uh, those polygons are uh, proposed gas development areas. So this data is profoundly important. And it is profoundly important because we can start prioritizing how we're going to use the land. Um, it, it's likely that those two areas are not a very good idea, but the other ones, I mean, we, we have to continue development. We have to do it wisely, though. And this type of data uh, will allow us uh, to do so. So I would like just to mention one more threat that biodiversity uh, suffers in Wyoming, which is habitat destruction and fragmentation. And these are threats, real threats, to Wyoming's natural diversity. Uh, I, I should mention that uh, why the, the Department of Transportation is very interested in the kind of data that I showed you. Because they are interested, I'm not sure in saving deer lives, but in saving people's lives because the deer are crossing um, highways. All right, but once again, I don't want you to take that message home. What I would like you uh, to take home is that Wyoming is a very special place because we can still find complete assemblages of wild species doing what they've been doing for millennia. Uh, in this place. Uh, which one of these species is native to, to Wyoming? I, I hope many of you fish. Uh, someone had the right answer. The cutthroat. The cutthroat. It is the Yellowstone cutthroat. Uh, all the other ones, uh, which are brookies, browns, rainbows, and lake trout are, are introduced. Um, so this is the only one. And so let's move now to the greater Yellowstone ecosystem. And I would like to present you a study um, done by Arthur Middleton, uh, one of our uh, students. And it has to do with the four migratory herds of elk in the greater Yellowstone ecosystem. Uh, these migratory herds, each one of these dots represents a single GPS point um, of individual food collars. They go and drop their babies during the summer around Yellowstone Lake. 
and then they move to the foothills in the winter and they come back. And they are not very long migrations, they are about, you know, of the order of 75 or so uh, kilometers, but they are very, very important ones. And these herds represent a, a, a significant amount of income for outfitters and, and, and meat for hunters in the foothills of Yellowstone. And there's a problem, and that's why Game and Fish funded this project. And the problem is that the populations are tanking. And the populations are tanking, uh, we know that because of the ratio of calves to cows. Uh, in the 80s, the ratio of calves to cows was about 40. There were 40 calves per 100 cows. And that's a, that's a good thing for a population. That's a population that's either stable um, or growing. It would be growing if it had not been harvested. Uh, the population rate, uh, ratio of calves to cows dropped to 25, and now uh, it's about 12.5. 12, 12 I, don't, I don't know if there's records for 2013, but I suspect that the trend will have continued. Um, this is a problem, and that's why they gave money to... Uh, so I would like to ask you, who is the culprit? Who is causing this, um, this effect? Wolves. Yeah. Uh, okay. Uh, so the consensus is that it's wolves. No, it's lake trout. Uh, um, no, I'm, I'm, I'm dead serious. I'm dead serious. And, and, and you probably think now Carlos has gone the deep end. You know? But um, yeah, it is a very, very likely uh, lake trout. I, I'm a certain in this as I'm certain of any of the scientific facts that I've mentioned you <laughs> in a second. Um, it used to be that Yellowstone Lake had very large populations of cutthroats, which is why I gave you that question. And they were semi anadromous They would move up streams uh, d during the early spring to spawn, and they were eaten by grizzlies. And in the 80s, there were about 60,000 trout moving up and down streams. Um, in 2000, Loja Tronstadt, another student, found there were only 10,000. And you cannot find them now. It's a phenomenon that has gone to extinction. And the phenomenon uh, corresponds with the introduction by someone with, um, I was going to use a bad word, uh, someone introduced lake trout. And the lake trout has pseudorous, and they eat um, cutthroats. And um, this was what the food web looked like uh, before the introduction of lake trout. What we had is that the grizzlies were feeding primarily, and we know this from stabilized, from chemical evidence. If you take the skulls, they have the distinct signature of an aquatic ecosystem uh, in the bare skulls. Um, the lake trout were introduced and started feeding on lake trout. So although there were always bears, which are increasing in population, feeding on calves, uh, with the disappearance of cutthroats, the predation by bears has increased enormously. And you can see distinctly the change in the chemical signature in the skulls of the bears. Um, the stable isotopes are a wonderful tool that allows, it, allows you to answer these questions. Um, this is just um, anecdotal evidence that they do kill calves. Um, so I, I hope to emphasize that in a place like ours, where processes take place at such vast spatial scales, whatever happens around Yellowstone Lake has economic and ecological repercussions in Cody, almost 100 kilometers away. We are connected by these migrations, biologically connected and economically connected. Um, so uh, I would like to mention one more threat to biodiversity in white number, which is invasive species. This is uh, cheatgrass and uh, a very, very serious threat, less in Wyoming than in the Great Basin. These are, are um, New Zealand mud snails. Uh, one of my colleagues has discovered that now 90% of the nitrogen recycling in the streams of Yellowstone is driven by these creatures. That didn't used to be the case and, and lake trout. But again, uh, although we should not minimize those threats, I don't want you to go back and think about them. But however, I just want you to, those of you that fish and have boats, this is the reason why Game and Fish is taking this campaign so seriously. If you have a boat, uh, don't move a mussel. Uh, clean your boat and drain it and dry it and all that stuff. And you have to pay, what is it, 15 bucks to keep your boat clean. Um, so Wyoming is special. I, I think it is really special. I think it's a place we should be really proud of. And let me mention the words of my hero, Aldo Leopold. He said, 
if the biota in the course of eons has built something we like, but we do not understand, and we're just beginning to understand diversity of biological diversity, then who but a fool would discard seemingly useless parts to keep every cog and wheel with the first precaution of intelligent tinkering? He was a bow hunter. He was a good man. Um, so Wyoming is special. And it's special because we still have the cogs and wheels. Um, so why should you care about biodiversity? This wraps this up. Because biodiversity supports life in, in our planet. You can see biodiversity is, you know, magic carpet of, of, of organisms on which we are traveling. Um, because biodiversity is useful. And I, I think it's as important to mention it because it nourishes the human soul, because it's beautiful. And because we are responsible for putting many species, breeds, genes, and ecological connections at risk. And you might think that it's frivolous to talk about biodiversity. It isn't. The things that we care about, uh, labor, knowledge, and culture, are as fueled by biodiversity as by manufactured capital, fossil fuels, fossil water, minerals, etc. They are an integral part of uh, the human enterprise. Biodiversity is. So why is Wyoming special? I, I got this, um, I think, from, from John Turner, because we can still get it right. I, I think it's one of the few places where we can still get it right. So what do we need to get it right? First, we need research. We need to document the state of biodiversity in Wyoming, from genes to landscapes. We have not done so. I just learned recently, we don't know where the frogs are. I'm serious. We don't know where the species of frogs are. Um, education, we need to train the next generation of biodiversity scholars who will document and very importantly manage Wyoming's biodiversity. We need boots in the ground doing this. Outreach, we need all Wyoming citizens to be really proud about their state. We need people to be passionate, knowledge knowledgeable and engaged about biodiversity. You cannot read that but um, I promised Marsha that I would not do propaganda for the Biodiversity Institute but that's what we need. We need a biodiversity institute, and we now have one. This is the very building in Laramie. It's a fantastic building. We just started about, what is it, four months ago? And uh, you know, know our um, mission, uh, in a bit long-winded mission. Um, so thank you very much. I hope you have questions. <laughs> yeah. So why aren't the bears eating the lake trout? Are they just not the same number? Lake trout don't spawn books? in streams, so they would have to go with scuba equipment to get them. <laughs> yeah, they don't. They are not anadromous. They don't move to spawn. They they, they spawn in gravel beds, they're, and there's a huge effort to remove them. The problem is very tricky because this is a deep lake with a lot of complexity. So. Yeah. Yeah. Right Isn't that a lovely experiment? No, they are not. So the non-migratory herds are doing just fine. It's just the migratory ones that move into the areas that were used by the, where the bears were, were using uh, uh, the trout. It's a lovely situation because Arthur took paired, you have pairs of, of populations that don't move and populations that move and move to, um, Yellowstone, to Yellowstone. So it's a very, very nice study. Yeah. Is there any evidence that the uh, migratory uh, herds are changing their patterns based on their reproductive success rates? No. And uh, that is a very perplexing answer. And um, at first, this project was funded, as you can imagine, uh, as a result of finding out whether the wolves were having an effect. And I lied to you. The wolves are having an effect. But they're not having an effect on cows and calves. They're having an effect on the wolves. And um, no, they don't seem to be doing so. And the reason for that, I suspect, is um, I will explain a little bit more about Arthur's project. He had colors not only on the elk, but also colors on the, on the wolves. And the encounter rates between wolves and elk are very rare. And, and, and that is probably the reason why this happens. Uh, yeah, I mean, one tends to think, and this was the common knowledge, that um, elk encountered, uh, a single elk would encounter uh, wolves every day of its life. It doesn't. What you find is that a wolf encounters elk, you know, very frequently, but an elk doesn't encounter wolf. They're, they're racist. 
you showed that because the bear men out feeding on the calves versus the fish, that the skull then was changing on the bear. Does that mean that even if you could mitigate the problem of like trout and bring back more pet trout, did that biologically change the bear's predilection to feed? on calves, or would it go back to feeding on a Yeah, I am sorry. I, I should have been a lot more careful about explaining how that works. Um, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to be a complete, for a moment, I will step back from my uh, biodiversity person thing and talk about physiology. Um, if you look at the molecules and you look at atoms, the carbon and nitrogen have two isotopes, heavy and light. Mm -hmm. And the ratios of heavy and light are different in aquatic and terrestrial ecosystems. So what Arthur found in collaboration with people uh, at the University of Washington is that those ratios of heavy and light carbon used to be aquatic before the introduction of Lake Tower and had become terrestrial. It's just a chemical change. It's just a very subtle change in the stable isotope composition of the skulls. Does that answer? And that, I, I suspect, doesn't have any change in their behavior. There's an ongoing effort, a very strong effort, including some very sophisticated technology to destroy the eggs in addition to trapping. How do you feel about that? Do you think they'll be able to destroy that population? I don't know. And uh, I, I don't know. I, I, I really hope so. And the problem is, and this is a, a problem that I, I, I think a lot about. Uh, the problem is that we tend to think about organisms as um, doing things instinctively, right? Well, they have cultures. And, and migration, yeah. movement up and down a, a, a stream and become anatomist, maybe a cultural practice. And I don't know, even if we remove all the lake trout, we may not recover anadromous migration uh, in, the, in, the, in the cultures. I don't know. I really hope that we will reduce the numbers, but I don't know. That is one of the things that we should be worried about uh, in the loss of ungulate migration, right? And there used to be, if you look at the Yellowstone Greater Ecosystem, there used to be migration routes of antelope north into Montana. And I don't know exactly why they became extinct. And they have not re evolved in the last 150 years. Or so. so I don't know. Yeah? What are the research projects, the major projects that you are planning on? Oh, we're doing in the a. Near term to solve some of these problems. Oh, we're doing a variety of them. One, one of the things we are doing, let me just explain one of our missions. And one of our missions is, I, I don't have a large enough staff yet to do a lot of basic research. So we have to rely on citizen science. So one of the projects that we're doing, I think just because it's a very cool thing, is find out where all the frogs are. Well, frogs are in the state. Amphibians are incredibly important, incredibly important uh, elements. Not so, not so much because they're important eco ecologically, they are, but because they are canaries, I'm mixing taxa, canaries in the mine. They have wet skins and they absorb, uh, absorb chemicals to their skins. They are, they're in club interest and we don't know where they are. So we're going to try to garner the citizens of the state to find that out. Um, one of the things that we are doing that is already uh, in progress is collaborating with uh, Game and Fish and with the Wildlife Co-op Unit to put together an atlas of ungulate migration. And that's a very, very important, um, that's a very important project. We need to put out for you know, for the Department of Transportation and for the citizens of the state, the state of the knowledge of, uh, of these migrations in, a, in an accessible web um, form. Uh, so we're doing a bunch, of, a bunch of those things. I must emphasize that our research capacity now is very, very small. I have a staff of two. Um, but one thing we can do is create grants for grad students that are doing important research. And we have a grant program. And I cannot tell you what that is, because if I could tell you, I would not be doing my job. Um, what is really important is what these people are going to discover over the next four or five years. Um, I hope to hire uh, academic staff that will be doing research, and, and that will happen in the future. Does that answer more of your question? Yeah, well, one would think that there's a lot of people <coughs> down there that are doing things. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And I, sorry, I, I misconstrued, yes, of course. And I misconstrued your question in that I said, what are we directly going to do? And one of our jobs, I think, is to take all this wealth of, uh, of research and make it accessible to the public. Our job is to synthesize the data and put it out in a form that is accessible to everybody. Thank you.
So that is a very, very important mission. And there's a lot of people doing that in the universe. There's an enormous amount of people doing biodiversity research from microbes um, all the way to um, ecosystems. There, there seems to be some um, impacts and threats that are being discovered from climate change and especially the Great Yellowstone ecosystem on, on biodiversity and maybe perhaps elevation, mm -hmm. species that are devoted to certain elevations, and how, how we can help save, by saving habitat and large forests, there's a sequestering or offsetting of carbon emissions that we could actually be contributing to helping stop the climate change. Oh God, that's a huge hot potato, Sorry. isn't it? No, no, I, I think it is. I, I think it is fine, and 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 the, it is very problematic because, uh, as I mentioned, we still have in the state processes that take place across very large scales, and so um, I don't think mitigation of carbon is going to take place anytime soon in the future, and we'll have to learn how to plan for those things, and planning for those things requires, and this is something that I will need the help of people in the social sciences to do if we take that mission, which we have not yet taken, is we have to think about the herd of elk. I'm sorry, we've talked so much about elk. I, I prefer birds, but elk are useful for these purposes. When they are moving from Yellowstone, from a national park, they're moving across forest service land, and then BLM land, and then they end up in uh, agricultural fields. They're crossing biological barriers. They're crossing also jurisdictional barriers with very different valuation modes. And it's something that I, I strongly suspect that class has something more to, to say than, uh, than I do. And uh, one thing that I've discovered, um, I, I don't know to my dismay, is that different units of BLM don't talk at all to each other, <laughs> uh, let alone with Forest Service. And so one of the things I hope the Biodiversity Institute will do is create a network of people are talking with each other so that we can start discussing these things in Wyoming don't take place at very small scales. So we need to have stakeholders talk with each other. And I hope that the spaces in the very center, and this may sound demagogic, but it has already happened, will allow people to come together and talk. We need to start discussing those things. And it's, it's going to happen. I, I, don't think that, um, I, I don't think that the trends that we're seeing in climate change are going to be ameliorated any time soon. What's the status of the, uh, um, was it CBM development on the winter range for the was migrating pronghorns down the red desert areas? You know what the status is on that? They yeah, still do I don't know. Um, it moves, it, that has been moving very, very fast. And I would like to emphasize one thing. And um, this is not to impose censorship on you guys. You can ask whatever you want. But we are not in the business of policy. That's not what we do. We do science. And if the science informs the policy, I would love the science to inform the policy. That's what right. the, the institute is going to do. But we will steer really clear of telling people do this or don't do that. All we can do is um, we show, but we do not tell. And, um, and that, that will protect us from the accusation of advocacy. We are simply, well, I mean, in some sense, we are advocating by producing good science. But, um, but our job is to be honest brokers of information. Thank you. That's what I would like the institute to be. It's a very important component of information. Is that more or less? I'm, I'm sorry, sorry I didn't answer your question. I don't know. I, that is going so fast that I, I don't know. So I guess that's it. Thank you so much, guys. <laughs>